Well, today uh, I have this really kind of set up more like a Bible study than it is a sermon. I've got a lot of scriptures to go over, but uh, something that's going to help us uh, get closer to God and overcome the battles that we find in our lives. Uh, I've got the message today is fighting your enemy. And I want to start off with some of the names, just a couple of the names in the Bible uh, that, that it has for, for Satan. And it says, one is the deceiver, the father of lies, the murderer, the god of this world. And I, you know, when I, when I first heard the god of this world, the first time I ever heard that, I thought, how is Satan the god of this world? God is God. But the Bible, when I, when I started reading it for myself, and let me tell you, you know, when I was growing up, I never read the Bible for myself. I just went to church and whatever the, uh, whatever the priest said, well, that's what I listened to. And I never read it for myself. But boy, when I started reading the Bible for myself, it became alive, and I started learning so much. And so when I saw, when I heard the first sermon at the Baptist church, and he said, the God of this world, and I thought, the God of this world, what, and what is that? But it clearly says, when I started reading for myself, that basically this is not our home. This world is not our home. Our home's in heaven. We fight an enemy, Satan, the deceiver, the tempter, and he rules this world with sin. You see? And that's what he tries to do is to get us to sin against God. So the Bible says he's the God of this world because this isn't our home. We're just passing through. Uh, another one is the tempter, the enemy. He's our enemy. So I have some scriptures I want to share today. And that's just a few of the, the names that the Bible has for him. Uh, there's many more you can look up and, and just see uh, what all the Bible says. Uh, I have all these scriptures in the bulletin that you can, if you want to take it home and you can kind of look at it and study it for yourself. And I've also started putting them at the end of each sermon. I have some leftovers. I put them over on the table of past sermons. So I'm going to start putting them over on the table with the, uh, the uh, sermon name with all the scriptures for each week. So if you want to take one home, they're in the bulletin either way. But First uh, Peter 5.8. And I think in the I think on my papers I put First Peter five eighty nine. Well, there's not such a thing as five eighty nine. It's five eight and nine. So I want to start with this one, and I just want to go through some scriptures today that talk about what it is that we really do fight. What it is that how how do we overcome it? How can we how can we how can we have <laughs> victory over these battles that we face? And I remember there was a guy that I used to go to church with, and he said. Uh, I remember him saying one time, you know, I, I went to a church where they never talked about Satan. They never talked about the enemy. They never talked about what it is that we're fighting. So he said, I never knew. I never knew that Satan was real. I never knew that we actually do have something that we fight. And so I, when I heard him say that, I thought, you know, I made a vow to God. Lord, any time you lay on my heart to bring a message about the enemy, about who it is that we fight as Christians... I want to make sure I do that because I want the Christian to know what is it that we're fighting. Because if we don't know who the enemy is, how can we have victory? It's just like if, you know, Lonnie, he's at military training this weekend. If they go into war with another country and they don't know who the enemy is and they don't know how the enemy fights, if they don't have a plan put in place, even our own military cannot win the battle. We as Christians have to know who the enemy is. We have to know how he works so we can rise up and fight back and have victory. And so that's important for us to know. So I want to start, and these are really in no uh, order. I just want to go through each one. That's why I was saying it's more of a Bible study type than what it is an actual sermon today. But I want to start in 1 Peter 5a. It says, To be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. 
who resist steadfast in the faith. You have to resist the devil. When you, when you feel that things are starting to rise up against you and starting to battle against you, you have to resist that. You have to rise up and fight against that. And you do it, as it says in verse 9, you do it in faith. You, you do it knowing that you can have victory over this battle through the cross, through Christ, through Jesus. So, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. When I, you know, I bring a lot of messages and a lot of Bible studies over this scripture. And I've got so many other scriptures today that I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one. But I will say, with this scripture, it just warns us that Satan is just roaming this earth, looking for somebody to pull away from God. And the best way I can explain it, you know, I usually use, I usually like to talk about how, it, when it says here that he's like a roaring lion, he's looking to devour somebody. And I like to use, uh, I like to use an example of how. The, how the animal will sit in the brush and wait and look for the weakest and he attacks and knows when to attack. But I just want us to know today with what the scripture says is Satan's just roaming this earth and all his legions of demons is just roaming this earth looking for a Christian to pull away from God, you see. And the best way I can explain it is we have 120 things to do every day. I mean, we are we're trying to get to school, we're trying to get to work, we're trying to pay the bills, we're trying to, we've got so many things to do. We've got all these deadlines to make. We've got things, just one thing after another in our lives, and we're running around 200 mile an hour trying to get these things done. And we have to be careful because when we do that, we, you know, we, we think, well, I'm gonna, I'll read my Bible tomorrow. So we don't read the Bible. And then tomorrow comes. But guess what? Tomorrow's just as busy as today. So we say, well, I'll read my Bible tomorrow. Well, now you're two chapters behind. And so the next day you say, well, I ought to read it tomorrow. Now you're three. And before you know it, the whole week goes by and your Bible never was open the whole week. See, this book is the Word of God. It's our sword. It's how we overcome the things that Satan puts before us. It's how we win our battles is through the Word of God. If Satan can keep us so busy and off track of doing what we're supposed to do, we become weak in our faith, and then we start to give in to temptations. We start to fall and waver away from God when we get out of this Word. This Word, when we read it every day, we get planted in the Word. Like I said, when I started reading the Word for myself, I just, man, my eyes were opened, and I just couldn't believe the things that I was reading, some of the things that I was taught in my life that was not even what the Bible said, you know? So get the Bible open and start reading it. Get, get in there and read it for yourself. Don't... Not even with me. I don't care who you're listening to. Don't just take my word for it. Get in the word, open it up, and read it for yourselves and see what it says. And when it becomes alive to you, if you get stronger. You start to thirst more for the word. You start to crave it. And it's just, it opens up so many new things in your life. So get in the word for yourself, and that's what it's there for to help us overcome some of these things that Satan puts our way. But we get so busy doing all these things in our life, trying to make the deadlines, all these things, all these things going on. We're, and while we have all these things going on, Satan has one thing to do in his day, and that's to pull you away from God. So it don't seem very fair, does it? You've got all these things, you're running around at 200 miles an hour, trying to get all these things done, and Satan has one job in his whole day. And that's to pull the Christian away from God. And that's it. That's all he has to do all day. So the when you compare the two, it sounds like he's got the advantage. One thing compared to your 500 things. But what we have to remember as Christians, it may sound like he's got the advantage, but he doesn't. 
we have the advantage because of this. See? And that's what we've got to remember. It's because of this that we have victory. Not because of this in the flesh. It's because of this. So, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. If you're coming to church, if you're serving the Lord, if you're trying to get closer to God, I guarantee you, you've got things rising up against you in your life. He doesn't want you at church. He doesn't want you doing the things of God. He doesn't want you to seek God's blessings. He wants you to stay in the world and, and away from God. So the next one I have is in Ephesians Chapter 6, 10 through 18. Now this one, <clears throat> this passage of scripture here tells us what it is that we fight. And it tells us how to overcome it. And that's what I just said, getting in the Word of God. But it starts in verse 10. It says, Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. When I read this, notice how many times it says to stand against the devil. To stand against the enemy. To stand when you fight. So you can't fight when you're laying down. You can't fight when you're running away. you got to stand and you got to fight the resistance. It says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So when we read this, there's many things that we see. First, like I said, it says to stand many times in this passage. We have to stand and fight those things that come to resist us. We also see in verse 12, it's not flesh and blood that we fight, but it's a spiritual wickedness. You know? One of the best examples I can give of this is when we have the invitation, when we talk about a spiritual battle, and, there, and the Bible clearly talks about a spiritual warfare that we fight within ourselves. When we have invitation at the end of a sermon, and we have invitation, and, and like I say, we can come up and uh, if you have something that you want to pray about, we can pray together right up here. You can pray right where you're at. If it's something that we really need to talk about and, and pray about, we've got a small prayer room in the back where nobody can hear anything that's being said. But when we have an invitation, And we start to play the music. And in your heart, you think, okay, I'm gonna, I need to go pray about this. I want to go, for, I want, I want to go pray about this. And then all of a sudden, here it comes. Oh, don't go forward. Don't go do that. What do they want to think? What's everybody else want to think? Oh, well, you can do it next week. Oh, don't. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Or maybe you came and prayed today, and the next week you have an, another urge to come forward and pray again, and you're thinking, well, I just went through last week, man. What do people want to think? See, that right there is a spiritual warfare. Let me tell you, anytime we open up invitation to pray, and you're feeling a pounding in your heart, a nervousness, you're feeling... Or maybe you're starting to ask yourself, should I go forward or should I not? If you need to come forward, you know when you need to come forward and pray about something. And I want to say that everybody in the church, when somebody comes forward and pray, we're not all going, what is that? Oh my gosh, I wonder what's wrong with them. You 
know what we're doing? And our hearts were rejoicing. You know why? Because the Bible says that when one person repents, or maybe somebody could come down and be praying for somebody else. We don't. We, it's nobody else's business what they come down and pray about. But let's say they come down, they've got something in their life that they want to pray about and get cleaned out. That's one. But the Bible says that when they do that, the whole heavens are rejoicing over that one person that came forward and repented. If the whole heavens are rejoicing, then I promise you that everybody in the church are rejoicing along with the kingdom of God. And let me say, if they're not, if they are the ones going, oh my gosh, what are they doing up there? They're the ones that need to be down here praying, okay? So anytime you feel like you need to come forward and pray, do it. Because if you do, you're going to get victory in your life. And that's what church is all about. It's about getting victory in your life, getting closer to God, getting your faith built. So a spiritual wickedness is whenever you feel like you need to go forward and pray, and all of a sudden the voices in your head start saying, no, don't do it. That's nothing more than a spiritual warfare that you're fighting. Satan don't want you to come forward. The enemy doesn't want you to come forward and get that victory in your life. Who says, you know, if you say, well, I'll do it next week. I'll tell you, the Bible clearly tells us we don't know what a day may bring forth. You may not be here next week. If you say, I've never given my life to the Lord, and oh, I'm not going to do it today, I'm going to do it next week. What if next week never comes? You know? We just don't know when we're going to leave this earth. So anytime you have a leadership, anytime you think that you need to come forward and pray about a need, uh, something that you want to get rid of in your life, or maybe somebody you want to pray for. It doesn't matter. If you feel like you need a victory over this thing and the Holy Spirit's working on you, come forward and get that victory. Don't let this spiritual wickedness keep you from God's victory in your life. It goes on in this passage and says... Notice in verse 11 it says to stand against the wiles of the devil that you fight, in the next verse, that you fight against a spiritual wickedness. It also says over in 16 to stand against the fiery darts of the wicked. In other words, Satan has schemes. Satan has ways to try to get you discouraged, to get you depressed, to get you to question God. He has all these ways to try to get you out of God's will. And that's what these scriptures are saying. Stand up against those fiery darts. It says it right there in 16. Stand up against those fiery darts of the wicked. Don't stand against the wiles of the devil. You're fighting a spiritual wickedness. And the closer you try to get to God, the more you're going to see these things come into play. Because listen, when you're not trying to serve God, when you're not trying to do the things of the Lord, you don't have resistance. Why? Because Satan already has you where he wants you. So why does he have to fight you? If, if you're already living in the world and doing those things that Satan wants you to do, then why would he continue to try to fight you to get to do those things? You're going to have resistance when you try to get those things out of your life and you're trying to serve God. That's when you're going to start to see this great resistance. Okay. So... The rest of this scripture I want to look at is it says to overcome these things, to put on the armor of God. In other words, when you read your Bible, you're arming yourself. It's your armor. It's how you're going to overcome the battles, the, the wiles of the devil, the fiery darts, as it says. The Word of God is how you're going to overcome those things. Also, when you read this, it, it shows us that there is there is it talks about your feet, your head, the breastplate. There's a piece of armor for every part of your body, except for the back. Notice when you read this passage of scripture, there's nothing for the back. One, when you're standing against the wiles of the devil, when you're standing and you're fighting against the enemy, as it says to do, that means you're going to be confronting 
the enemy. You're going to be standing in front of. When you're, in, when you're fighting the enemy, you're facing them. So why do you need something for your backside? Now, if you want to run away from the enemy, then you're going to need something for your backside because now you're away from the enemy. You're going the opposite direction trying to run. And if he's shooting fiery darts at you, I guarantee you, he's going to devour you as the first scripture said. So don't run from the enemy. Christians, we are not meant to run from the enemy. We are meant to stand against the wiles of the devil and move forward in what we're trying to do. Okay? Now, another... Uh, in fact, I heard this from a, from a friend of ours. He was saying the backside armor is to pray for one another. When you pray for the other people in the church, that prayer is covering their back. So, when you read the scriptures, notice there's nothing for your back. Because we are to stand against our battles, stand against the enemy, and move forward. We are not to turn around and run the other way, and then pray for one another to cover each other's back. Another one is in Job 1.6. I want to look at today. Now this one says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also with them. So, and, and there's other scriptures in the Bible that say that, but this is the one that came to my mind. Um, so now, so you have the sons of God going to the Lord's house, and it says Satan went with them. Let me tell you, when you're going to the Lord's house, and Satan comes with you, he's not coming with you to congratulate you on making a decision to serve God. He, he's not coming with you to the Lord's house to come to church with you and hope that you have victory in your life against him. He's coming with you to try to cause chaos. He's coming with you to try to cause problems so you don't make it to the Lord's house. He's, for an example, you're getting up to come to the Lord's house on Sunday or whenever it is. The phone rings. There's a so-called emergency so you don't go to church. And usually those emergencies turn out to be nothing. I mean, it's just, you know, it could have waited probably for two more days. But things tend to rise whenever you're on the way to the Lord's house. That's because when God's people are on the way to the Lord's house, Satan comes with them to try to keep them from making it. You, as Christians, we are all fighting a spiritual battle. We are all fighting the, the same enemy. Do you, and, and as a matter of fact, do you know that hell is mentioned more times in the Bible than heaven? That's because Jesus is trying to warn us. It's real. It's true. He's trying to warn us of the things that we're going to have to fight against. And that's what we're doing today with all these scriptures. And it shows us very clearly right here that when the God's people were on the way to the Lord's house, Satan came with them to try to make sure that they didn't get there. So let me put it to you this way. When you get up to go to church and you say, man, I'm just tired. I really don't want to get up today. Make it a point to get up and go. Whenever you're on your way to church and the phone rings, I, I suggest turn your phone off until you get to church, and then whenever you get done with church, then turn it on. That way you don't have an opportunity to get those stupid phone calls that keep us from going to church. Anything, and be aware that anytime you start, you're in church, you're going to church, or whatever my case might be, and all of a sudden something comes into your life that's keeping you from going to church, you better get rid of it. There's nothing in your life as important, no person, no thing, no material thing, no relationship, whatever it is. Nothing is more important in your life than your relationship with God. And if it's going to keep you from serving the Lord, you better get rid of them. The sons of the, the God's people were on the way to the Lord's house, and Satan went with them. 
Like I said, it wasn't to congratulate him. It wasn't to see him get saved. It wasn't to see him be baptized. It was to see him not go, to cause problems, to arise, to keep them from getting there. So anytime you notice something, uh, when you're on the way to church or you're thinking about going to church or whatever it might be and there's things, well, maybe I won't go because I need to go do that. That's when you better make sure that you make it a point to go to church. And let me tell you something. When you begin to do those things, when you begin, when you're going to church and things keep rising up and to, to make you not go, and you recognize that and you see that Ephesians chapter 6 warned us of those things and and you say, you know what, I'm going to make it a point to go. And every time that you do that, you'll notice that you start getting less resistance in that area because Satan knows he can't, he's not going to keep you from going. He can't, he can't win this part, this battle in your life. So he'll let up on that part and it'll start to get easier to go to church. I'm just using this one area as an example because of that scripture. But beware that he might, in this area, ease up the battle because he sees that you're not going to not go to church, that you're not going to give in to this, but he'll move on to something else. Maybe your past. Maybe, whatever it might be. But he'll use something to try to tempt you away from God. There's always going to be something. But when you stay steadfast and you don't give in, it becomes easier for that one area. He'll start to lessen up the fiery darts and the wild and all those types of things because he realizes you're not going to give in. He'll move on to something else, though, when the time's right. Okay, James 4, 7. I've got a lot of scripture today, but it'll help us. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw close to God, and He will draw close to you. So here we see, all we have to do is submit to God. Trust the Lord. When you submit yourselves to God, like I've just been saying, not just today, but always. Anytime you submit to God, you give your life to the Lord, you're trying to do the right things, you're trying to you're trying to get active in the church, whatever it might be, notice it says, resist the devil. Just like I got through saying, folks, I can't tell you, I, I can say it 500,000 times, I don't know how many other ways to say it. When you try to do things for God, when you try to come to church, when you try to do the right thing, you're always going to have resistance. You're always going to have something rise up against you to try to keep you from doing it. And it says right here that when you submit yourself, submit yourselves to God and resist the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Just, in other words, just don't give in to it. Beware. Know it's going to happen. Prepare yourself for it. Know that you're going to have resistance. Know that you're going to have a battle. Prepare yourself. How do you prepare yourself? With the Word of God, which you saw in Ephesians chapter 6. Read the Word. Put on the armor of God. And that way, whenever you feel the resistance, you can start to speak the Word of God over those temptations, over those problems. And when you speak the Word of God, I promise you, you will have victory over it. It says, draw close to God. And God will draw close to you. Do you know that when... It seems like we're getting further away from God in our life. It ain't God getting away from you. It's you getting away from God. So, when you get closer to God, God gets closer to you. Get in the Word. Pray. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. Now, I don't have this one written down. I want to look at Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 11, because this is the perfect example of what we just read in James 4, 7, 8. 
this is where Jesus himself it's already five till um, I want to close with this I'll finish this up tonight Wednesday night whatever wherever, however long it takes because I got a lot of scripture uh, I, I want to close today with a scripture that I didn't even have written in my in my notes. Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 11. Now, as I just said, anytime you do something for God, you're going to have resistance. Satan's going to be there to try to to resist to put resistance in your life to keep you from having God's blessings. Here we see Jesus just fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He just did something for God the Father. He did something spiritually in his life, okay? Now, as I said, anytime you do something for God, anytime you do something spiritual, anytime you do something for the Lord, you're going to have resistance, okay? Jesus just tempted, or Jesus just fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, here comes Satan. Here comes the enemy. And he tried to tempt Jesus. See? He did something for God the Father. He did something for his spiritual life. Boom! Here comes the battle. As I said, anytime you do something for God, you're going to have it happen in your life. Prepare for it. Know it's going to happen. But don't worry about it. You already have the victory. Okay. So, it says Satan came to Jesus after he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and he began to tempt Jesus. He tempted Jesus three times. Actually, it, I mean, you can look at it in other ways. There's four times. A couple of times he did this when he he questioned who Jesus was. He he said to Jesus, "If you're the Son of God, well, he just questioned who Jesus was. So you know, if you have anger issues, if you have problems with with uh, anger and and uh, get upset real easy and those types of things, well, boom, you already right there. You would already sin against God because he just questioned who you were." What happens when people question who you are? Do you get upset? I mean, do you get mad? Or, I mean, Jesus just fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And remember, the Bible said in that first scripture that we looked at that Satan is like a roaring lion sitting back like he just waiting to devour somebody. And this is a perfect example of that. He's sitting back waiting for the perfect time to devour us, whether it's our past, whether it's a temptation, whether it's a relationship, or whatever it might be. He's sitting back waiting for the perfect opportunity to attack. Well, here he, sit, he sits back and he's watching Jesus. What perfect opportunity is there to try to tempt Jesus into sin after he fasted 40 days and 40 nights? Because what a perfect opportunity. Surely he's tired. I mean, we're talking about the Son of God. So Satan had to wait for the perfect opportunity, just like he does you and me. He's waiting for the perfect opportunity to go after Jesus. He hasn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. This might be the only chance that Satan has to try to get him to sin against God the Father. Because maybe he's tired mentally, physically. He hasn't eaten so many days. So now he's going to go after Jesus. And he says, if you're really the Son of God, well, if Jesus had an anger problem, he would have said, excuse me? What do you mean, if I'm the Son of God, you know? got to keep your anger in check. I don't let people question you. Who cares? As long as your relationship is good with God, that's all that matters. Just worry about you and God. Who cares what people think about you or say about you or, or whatever? Don't worry about those things. It doesn't matter. Only your relationship with God. When your relationship with God is right, all your other relationships will be fine. God will handle all the other ones. And if you have enemies and people rise up against you, the Bible already says that, that God will make your enemy your footstool. So don't worry about it. You know, don't, don't worry about your enemies. God will take care of it. So here he tempts Jesus. Now he says, okay, if you're the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Oh, okay. So now, you see, now, as I said, Satan goes after you. He knows how to tempt you. He knows when to do it. He knows how to do it. We see him go after Jesus after he fasted 40 days. He questioned who he was. And knowing he hasn't eaten, he said, make those stones into bread. Hmm. See, he knows how to tempt us. 
Why didn't he say make those stones into wood? Make those stones into, into water. Make those stones. No, he said make it into bread. Why? Food. Eat. Tempt. Temptation. See? When you're trying to do things in your Christian life, Satan knows how to try to tempt you out of it. It's just like he did Eve in the garden. God came and said, don't eat of this tree. So what does Eve do? She goes to the tree. I mean, there's all these other ones, and this one's over here, and she goes all the way over there. And leaves. Why is she even going over there? You know? And Satan lies to her and says, no. Did, did God say that if you eat of that tree that you'll die? And she said, yeah. And he said, well, you're not going to die. He just said that because he knows that if you do eat of it, that you'll be like another God, and that you'll know good from evil. And then in that scripture, in Genesis chapter 3, it says, it was pleasant to the eye. Anytime you're tempted, anytime, some, anytime Satan tries to tempt you away from God, it's always pleasant to the eye. It always looks good. You better be careful. And notice that whenever Eve gave in to that sin and ate of that tree, she gave to her husband. When people sin around you, they try to get you to partake in what they're doing. Be careful. That's why you got to separate yourselves from the world. That's why sometimes when you when you get closer to God and you're getting stronger in the Lord, sometimes you've got to check yourself and say, do I really need this group of friends in my life? Because it's not that I don't love them. It's not that I don't like them. It's not that I... Man, I, I really need to get closer to God and I need to get away from some of those things. you got to start checking yourself and I'm not saying you know just cut them out of your life and don't ever see them again but you've got to be careful because if they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing and you're trying to get closer to God the Bible says you got to separate yourselves and it's not always easy because we love those people and, and we're talking family, friends so but when Satan tries to tempt us, it's always pleasant to the eye. So he said to Jesus, turn that, turn that, turn the stones into bread. Oh, that would look good to the eye. You haven't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. Come on now, you know? I mean, I remember at the restaurant, we would feed somebody breakfast. They'd be back three hours later for lunch, and they was already in a bad mood because they're already hungry. It's been three hours. He hadn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. Can you imagine that? Turn the stones into bread. But Jesus said, just as we've already seen in Ephesians chapter 6, this is how you overcome it. This is how you win those battles. Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He's speaking the word of God. That's what we have to do. The psalmist said, Thy word will I hide in my heart that I might not sin against God. If you're not putting this in your heart, then whenever Satan tempts you, how are you going to speak it? If, it's not, if this is not in your heart, how are you going to speak it? The Bible says the job of the Holy Spirit is to bring all things to our remembrance. That we can fight against these temptations and battles. But you know what? If we're not doing our job in hiding the word of God in our heart, how can the Holy Spirit bring something from our remember if it's not even there? You know? So we've got to do our part and put this in our hearts so whenever we're being tempted or fighting battles against the enemy, we have to hide this in our hearts so we can speak over those temptations and have victory, just like Jesus did. You say, well, my battle is, who knows, uh, alcoholism, whatever, whatever it might be. You know what? Get, get in the Word and find scriptures about drinking, about alcohol, and hide them in your heart. And then the next time, and get closer to God, and God will get closer to you. And you know what? The next time that you are tempted with that, begin to speak God's word over it because you hid it in your heart. But, and I, I've done that. Uh, when I first started preaching, uh, I always hid scriptures in my heart about having faith in God to get me through it because I am not somebody to get up and bring sermons. I'm not somebody to get up and do this. Only God can do this through me. 
So I hid scriptures in my heart to help me know that when I started thinking, oh gosh, I've got to give, give a sermon and I don't even know. I hid those scriptures in my heart. And before I got up and preached, I could speak over those feelings of I can't do this, that spiritual battle that we just talked about. And you know what? When I did that, the feelings of I can't do this went away. And I knew that I could do it. Because it wasn't me doing it. It was God. It was the Holy Spirit in me. So hide the scriptures in your heart. Okay, so he spoke the word of God, the same thing that we have to do. Then the devil took him into a holy city, sits him on the pinnacle of the temple, said to him, once again, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. So here, wouldn't it be nice if he can get Jesus to jump off the side of a mountain and kill himself? Suicide. How many suicides do we see in the world today? I'm telling you, all these things that we see in the world, cutting ourselves, suicide, all these things, it's all in the Bible, and it's a spiritual warfare. It's evil. That's all it is. We see it right here with Jesus, the Son of God. Satan tried to get Jesus to do the same thing. Jump off the mountain. If you're the Son of God, just jump off this mountain. Because he said, if you are, then the angels just will come down and get you. You'll be all right. But Jesus, once again, spoke the word of God, and he said, you are not to tempt the Lord thy God. See, that's why you're not going to see snakes in this church, and I'm not going to be up here holding snakes, okay? I, there's churches that do that. I'm going to tell you, hey, God gave me a brain, too, to use. I'm not going to sit there and hold a poisonous snake up next to my head. I'm not going to, I'm not going to tempt the Lord to God. I'm not going to sit here and do things. Uh, yes, I trust in my Lord. Yes, I trust God. Yes, I believe that my Lord can help me through any situation, but... We also got to not put ourselves in situations that could cause harm to ourselves. We, you know, uh, and that's what Jesus is saying right here. He said, "I'm not going to jump. I'm not going to jump off this mountain." It says that you are not to tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil takes him up into a sitting high mountain, shows him all the kingdom of the world and the glory of them, and said to him, "All these things will I give you if you'll fall down and worship me." Now. This one is, well, I mean, Jesus is on the way to Mount Calvary to give his life on the cross, to die for the sin of the world, to take on the most pain and suffering that anyone's ever known. And, and Satan is offering him his kingdom on this earth with no pain, no suffering, if he just falls down and worships Satan. So... I can see a lot of Christians taking the easy way out. And it would have been the easy way out for, for Jesus to do this. But he didn't. But once again he said, It is written, You shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. So there's three examples right there where Satan waited for the perfect opportunity to try to tempt Jesus. He questioned who he was. He tried to tempt him with bread. He tried to question who he was to jump, to commit suicide and do all these other things. Three times Jesus spoke the word of God. And then it says, as James 4, 7, 8 told us, it says, then the devil left him. See, when you're being tempted, when you're having all these battles rise up against you and you continue to have faith, you continue to trust your Lord, you continue to move forward with the armor of God and stand up against all those things that Satan tries to throw at you. Just keep speaking the word of God. Just keep doing the things of the Lord. Keep doing those things. And as it did with Jesus, the devil will finally leave you. It's right there. But I will say, if it took Jesus three times to do that, as the Son of God, it's probably going to take you 33 times because we're not as strong as what Jesus is. Okay? So, there's an example that I don't have on the list, and I want to close with that because it's already 5 after 12. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, close us in prayer this morning, and then I'll come back tonight. Uh, we'll 
do some more. Now, there's so many scriptures that might even take like we did last time. Last Sunday we did uh, the power of God. It took Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night to do that whole message. This might be the same thing. I don't know. Now, there's a lot of scriptures to go over. But uh, if we'll stand, we'll have closing prayer. And uh, Lord, I come to you today, Father. We just thank you, Lord. We just thank you for this day. We thank you for the scriptures that we've seen this morning. And just help us, Lord, to open our eyes to see uh, the ways that the enemy will try to get us away from your will, to get us to stop serving you, to get us to question the things that you have uh, for us. Uh, Lord, so I just uh, I thank you for that, Father, and I just pray that you watch over us as we go home, uh, get us there safely, and, and we just thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen.